Welcome to Disney's Four Scores. I'm John Burlingame. This podcast series brings together the most accomplished film and television composers working today and reveals the emotional journeys, inspirations, and unique challenges of their work. Our guest today played a significant role in the music of Steven Spielberg's reimagining of the classic Broadway and film musical West Side Story. He is a four-time Grammy-nominated music producer and supervisor. He has served as music coordinator, supervisor, or producer on such mega-hit screen musicals as Chicago, Dreamgirls, Aladdin, and Beauty and the Beast. Among his other credits, all nominees for Guild of Music Supervisors Awards are Rock of Ages, Saving Mr. Banks, and Annie. Welcome, Matt Sullivan. Thanks, John. Nice to be here. Matt, what's your history with this music and this show? When did you first encounter West Side Story? I grew up in a household with six kids, and I was the musical person. I grew up playing piano since nine years old, and very early I saw the 1961 film on TV, and it just really blew me away of these young guys in a gang with this this beautiful music like supporting them, and it was just something that really stuck with me through the years. What is it about this Leonard Bernstein score and these Stephen Sondheim lyrics that are so special? I think if you really look at the score and take the lyrics away, Leonard Bernstein's music tells such a story just on its own. It's brilliant that it's complicated and also really accessible to the normal person. And then you just add on Stephen Sondheim's lyrics. I think it was an accidental mistake that they brought on a super young, Stephen Sondheim, who I know is 25 around the time, but our cast right now and the cast that are usually in these shows are around that age. Our median cast, I think they said, was 22. So, you know, you have a Stephen Sondheim that's around a similar age writing these lyrics about love and passion, and I mean, just it's just brilliant. So you're billed here as executive music producer. What does that mean? So it's an interesting thing because uh, music supervising nowadays is picking out songs and compiling a soundtrack. And, and if there's an on-camera, you're on set for it. Um, over the years since I started about 20 years ago, the more I learned when I s sit in a recording studio producing the orchestra, I'm giving uh, notes on dynamics and, and everything. So I'm much more into the producing mode. I produce the vocals, and I do a lot of vocal editing and tuning myself. So I kind of really kept evolving my role. So executive music producer is, for me, because it is a nebulous term, and that's probably why you're asking, is I'm in charge of the music overall. I'm the captain of the ship, and the executive part is hitting the dates, getting ready for, for shooting, all that coordination and overall supervising. And then the producing part is the more creative part of the job. I'm sort of curious about the early stages of all of this. I presume you you must have met with Steven Spielberg and had discussions about what to take from the existing scores and what might be needed for a new shoot. Yes, we, when I say we, it was David Newman and I, we were just interlocked from the beginning. And uh, we went in, met with Steven uh, over at Amblin, and we just started talking through the movie, song by song. And we always were starting off at the 1957 Broadway show, and we would talk about everything from Tempe to orchestration and arrangement and how he was going to shoot it, what extra music or what he needs and what's not working and what really is working. And that was our first couple of meetings. Stephen would sit there with his iPad and play the songs and start and stop and talk about it and uh, really just jumped right in right off the start. Did the original score need to be updated or modernized in any way? No, I, why, you know, why mess with it? It is perfection. And, you know, the trap sometimes people may fall into is like when you look at an existing score or a property, you may just want to change it for the sake of changing it. But for this, this was, it's pure, it's beautiful. And we worked with the Leonard Bernstein organization to keep it in the world of Bernstein and never like deviate from what would, what would it sound like if Leonard was still around.
Of all the original creators of the show, only Stephen Sondheim was still alive when you did this. Yeah. Did you involve Sondheim, and did he alter any of his lyrics for you? We were so lucky that he was with us, and we brought him in early, because when they went from 1957 to the 61 film, they augmented the lyrics and changed some things. Stephen was heavily involved with Steven Spielberg and Tony Kushner on vocal assignments. You know, we changed Cool, so now Cool involves Tony. So there's a lot of that vocal assignments and some changes in the America lyrics. And Stephen was, Stephen and Stephen, we call them the SS's, SS1 <laughs> and SS2, and Mr. Spielberg will say he's SS2. But he was really around all the time, came to our rehearsals, watch the choreography, listen to the actors singing the, the songs, and uh, we always had discussions afterwards of what tweaks we needed to make. God, what's it like getting notes from Stephen Sondheim? And I was, you know, you're, you're intimidated at the beginning, but I wasn't the actor on the other side of the glass, so <laughs> I felt more for them. You know, when you're sitting in a recording studio and you're looking through a glass and, and you're seeing Steven Spielberg sitting next to Steven Sondheim, and then, you know, Leonard Bernstein's uh, representatives and, and children all through this window, the actors, they were, I'm sure, a little bit intimidated. I was intimidated because, I mean, it's Stephen Sondheim. And so every note he gave to us was precious. And we always, you know, wanted to address all his notes. How was Gustavo Dudamel chosen to conduct the score? Well, there's this guy you might know in, in the film music business called John Williams. <laughs> John was our music consultant. He was around quite a bit. I mean, talking about intimidating is me sitting in a room with Stephen and John discussing the music. And, you know, it's those pinch me moments of like, oh my, oh my, oh my God, I think I've done pretty well for myself in the film music business <laughs> yeah. sitting in this room and they're listening to me and they're taking my advice. So John recommended to bring in Gustavo and some of my happiest moments on this film were just sitting behind him and following the score, but I couldn't help but just basically forgetting about the score and just watching him. He's such a master of an orchestra and you could feel them just a gel between the orchestra and him. And in this case, the orchestra was the New York Philharmonic, yes, right? Yeah, the New York Phil. So, you know, Leonard Bernstein, uh, he was a musical director of the New York Phil for years. So there was like no even discussion of like, it's going to be the New York Phil in New York City, and it's going to be Gustavo, and we're so happy that it was Gustavo. He talked about fire and just bringing passion to the music. You know, this is music the New York Phil has played mm, countless times. And uh, a great conductor gets them, gets them to play it like it's their first time with this unbelievable passion. I think it's the best they've ever played it. So there are two other names on the poster, if you look closely, besides yours. And one is David Newman, who you've mm -hmm. mentioned, but the other is Janine Tesori. What did Janine do? Janine, in the Broadway sense, was our musical director. You know, a lot of times your musical director is helping a actor who's maybe not a singer first, but an actor first, and bring them in, build them up in chops. But Stephen handed us a cast that every single person was already at 95% there. And Janine really took them from 95 to 110% and brought out these beautiful solo, duet, and, and overall ensemble performances. And we should probably say that Janine is herself a major Broadway Huge. songwriter. So she's another sort of high profile person to be part of the it team. It was a collaboration of giants. You know, Janine, David, John Williams, Gustavo, we had the great Sean Murphy engineering, David Channing and Eric Swanson are just like top of the game score editors. And, um, you know, we had the creme de la creme of, of talent that was surrounding this project. Did you need to be on set during the shooting? I was on set every single day, except for <laughs> I missed I missed a couple days of America because I caught a stomach bug. And the reason why I even mention it is because 
Steven uh, Spielberg sent me chicken noodle soup and Gatorade every <laughs> single day that I was out sick, and it was like <laughs> the nicest thing in the world. So what was your job when you were on set? I do everything from, I make sure we're set up for the day of what we're, what we're going to um, shoot, make sure Pro Tools, everything's all set up. I work with the sound mixer. I've already had conversations with Steven, so I know what we're shooting and how we're going to shoot it live. I'm kind of like the, oh, I am the encyclopedia of the music on the film set. How much live singing was actually done on the set? Well, they're always, they're always singing. My rule is lip sync is not moving your mouth to the music and pretending you're singing. It, it is actually singing. And I always mic every actor, regardless if we're doing playback or live singing. So therefore, if there is a change in what they do, I always have a recording of what they did actually on set. Live singing, we did balcony scene. One of my thrills was working with Rita Moreno on set singing somewhere live. She was like, it's no choice, I'm doing it live. I'm like, absolutely, <laughs> I'm like, we're doing it live. Um, unbelievable performances that is Ariana DeBose and Rachel Zegler doing A Boy Like That and I Have a Love all live. So when you watch that and that passion and power of them belting at each other, it's all, it's all real. It's all happening live on the set. Oh, that's great. Now, the order of the songs is slightly altered from what we remember from either the show or the 61 movie. And I wonder if you can talk about that. Well, Tony Kushner did some reorganization of, of the songs. And for this movie, he wanted to have a lot more backstory, he wanted to give Tony a little bit more. So we have Move Cool and had Tony involved in that song, which happens before the rumble. And then uh, one of my favorite moves is I Feel Pretty, putting it after the rumble. So, I mean, I, I don't want to, did we give away the movie too much? Well, well <laughs> it's Romeo and Juliet, so people know right. kind of what happened. But knowing the, the disaster that just happened that night, and Maria is working the night shift, and she starts to sing I Feel Pretty, unbeknownst to her that her world has really fallen apart. And this bittersweet moment where she's enthralled and in love, but it's also heartbreaking to know that Marie is about to find out some really bad news. So how long were you on the whole project? Um, I'm gonna say three years in total. Wow, do you have a favorite moment in the movie? It was an accident. So when um, the jets are, are singing and they come around the corner and when you're a jet, you stay a jet and Riff sings this long note, and these cars are all stopping because they're just they're just walking across the street like they own the place. He's like, when you're a jet, er, you, er, stay, er. And all the tire squeals were in the correct pitches and in the correct timing. It, it was just it was just magic. You know, it's, oh, it was a fun great. moment. That's great. I need to ask you, why did West Side Story need a new version? Why is this movie important? The first thing is, it's Romeo and Juliet, and it's a story that transcends any generation. No matter what, no matter where you are in time, there's always jets versus sharks somewhere in the world. So it's always important to tell that story of, hey, you know, we are different, but we can be together. You know, there is an olive branch between people, and let's find it. Yeah. Well, it's great. Thank you, Matt, for sharing your Thanks, experiences John. on West Side Thank Story. You. Disney's Four Scores is brought to you by the Four Scores playlist, featuring music and interview clips from each composer featured in the podcast series, including songs and score from West Side Story, directed by Academy Award-winning director Steven Spielberg, from a screenplay by Pulitzer Prize and Tony Award winner Tony Kushner. The Four Scores playlist is available on all major music streaming services. Experience the magic behind the music you love whenever you like. Experience 20th Century Studios' West Side Story in theaters and listen to the soundtrack wherever music is enjoyed. Add West Side Story to your movie collection on digital and Blu-ray this March. <laughs>